All right, so in this uh, video, I want to cover bourgeois production. This is capitalist production. So this is really what the whole point of this series of videos is about, is to explain capitalist production in a Marxist way uh, so that we're clear what capitalism is. I mean, you know, people often talk about capitalism as if they know what it is, but they don't really have any analysis or any way of describing it. So we're actually describing capitalism uh, so that we're aware of the economic political system in which we actually live. And it's kind of nice. Uh, how come we haven't ever had a description of this before? Um, uh, that's a good question. Okay, so um, transition to bourgeois, uh, the bourgeois form of production. Now, using bourgeois, uh, because that's a very, it's kind of a, 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 a term that's thrown around within Marxism. So bourgeois means uh, capitalist. And, and, um, and of course, a capitalist is a specific type of person, but bourgeois is the way in which even people who are not capitalist adopt the ideology of the capitalist. Um, and, and I'll have more to say about that uh, as we go deeper into this. Um, but bourgeois, uh, etymologically, the way, the way the word comes about, it's just the, the French form of burger. So Germans would say a townsperson is a burger. Uh, the French would say the townspeople are the bourgeois, the bourgeoisie, um, the people who live in, and notice the burg, is still in there, but uh, townspeople are, are called bourgeoisie. Um, and bourgeois is like just thinking more uh, in terms of like an adjectival form of that. And, um, and it's from the bourgeoisie that capitalism emerges. And so uh, that's that. And in England, they're called uh, millions, people who lived in villages, but then as they moved into cities, they were still called villains. Um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, Marx uses this term bourgeois quite a bit. And then Marxists are, are, use it quite a bit. But it's very closely related to that burger style of production that I was describing. And, and Marx doesn't uh, really talk about burger uh, production as I did previously. Um, he just skips directly into bourgeois production, but I think that's a nice little bridge to bridge the gap there. <clears throat> okay. So we have a burger style production going on here. Um, I'm using part of the money accumulating to, to reproduce the labor of my journeyman. And, you know, I may have multiple journeymen, you know, the shop can get larger and larger uh, as, as a demand, uh, whatever demand can, can I need to keep up with. Um, but now we're going to further commodify the picture. And it's with this last phase of commodification that capitalism really comes about. So one way, <clears throat> uh, you know, we might think, okay, I'm still the master craftsman um, and we're making swords, but now I'm not going to do that whole apprentice thing. I'm going to do it in a different way. And this is the way that capitalism comes about. So now, the necessary consumption of the laborer is, is purely a market exchange. I buy as a master craftsman who has now become a capitalist because I just have a lot of money wealth. Um, 
So I, I, I've accumulated so much money wealth that I can just go out and just buy the labor that I need from the marketplace. There's lots of desperate people, as, as more described, of uh, people who are begging and robbing because they're just trying to get enough bread to eat. Um, you know, if I if I give the right price uh, for their labor, these people are going to come and work for me. There's lots of unemployed people, uh, but you know we don't even think of them as unemployed in the way that we do today because they're just serfs that are now wandering about uh, idle and and not uh, being productive in society. Uh, and so I can use that surplus labor that's just out there wandering around, and and we have an increase in population coming into the 16th century. Uh, after the little ice age begins to let up a bit and the plague begins to let up a bit, uh, we have an increase in population and lots of people coming to cities and uh, I being a master craftsman and, and right in the city and there's just all these extra people coming in. I'm going to hire some of them and put them to work and I don't need to uh, do that whole apprentice thing. Now, that has, you know, some nice features that I don't have to, you know, babysit this boy for years and years and years. Um, but of course, that was something of a nice social relationship because that boy, you know, became like a son to me. And and then I taught him to be a master craftsman. That's that's awesome. Uh, and there's something just very nicely satisfying about that. But now I'm like at a bigger level and, and, and I'm, I'm rethinking the way that we're going to do this and this just happens naturally i mean nobody really schemed to come up with this just little by little this emerges out of um, the market place in the city and the in the city way of life and so i just go and i buy laborers from the marketplace and i bring them into my shop which now is set up a little differently with the journeyman he was making a sword from start to finish. And that was the whole point of the masterpiece is that he really shows that he can make a really great sword from start to finish. But now what I'm going to do in my shop is I'm going to start to uh, implement what's called the division of labor. And so division of labor is really important. And this is a key concept that was developed and um, analyzed very carefully by uh, Adam Smith. And and uh, and again, Marx is taking a lot of of his political economy uh, theory from Adam Smith. So he follows Adam Smith in the labor theory of value, and he follows Adam Smith in understanding the division of labor. So that's a really good analysis, and and Marx does not um, does not uh, disagree with any of that. So. We have this division of labor where um, one of the laborers is just feeding the coal into the furnace and one of the laborers is pouring the molten and one of the laborers is making the molds. Uh, and, and they just specialize in one small part of the production process and what happens with the division of labor at first it's sort of a crude division um, into you know, seg segments of the production process, but little by little, it gets more refined so that each laborer is doing, just doing a very short uh, activity and doing it very repetitively. So they get good at doing this one thing and, and, and they can do it very quickly. And because they're just focused on doing that one aspect, there's not a lot of moving around the shop unnecessarily. You can start to develop something like an assembly line. Um, not a full factory assembly line, but something similar to that. And that's, of course, where this is all going, ultimately ending up with like the Ford car manufacturer in an assembly line where the, the vehicle is just moving down the line and one guy's just putting in bolts, right? And one guy's taking the hood and placing the hood, like over and over again, placing the hood, placing the hood. And it, the car is just moving down the line and you're just doing one car after another just doing these little pieces uh, in the division of labor. At the end of the medieval period, as people begin to move into cities, shops start developing this division of labor um, process, and it takes centuries to get to the Ford automobile factory. But 
it comes out of that burger style of production and is just being modified uh, little by little. So what I'm doing now is as this um, as this sword manufacturer, you know, the guild is is no longer important to me because I'm not really producing master craftsmen. I just have your basic laborer coming in uh, and doing one small task that pretty much anybody could do. Like there may be a minimal training, but but just the kind of training that happens within a number of days. And then they can come in and replace whoever I'm missing from my production process. So now the, the labor, and this is the big thing about capitalism, is that labor becomes a commodity. Labor is a commodity that is purchased in the market. And I purchase that labor uh, at, a, at a low exchange value and use that labor, the labor has use value for me, uh, to make swords or whatever I happen to be making, but let's stick with that example. And there's a certain amount of that labor that's needed to make enough swords so that I can sell those in the marketplace and then repurchase uh, that same laborer all over again next week. And so I'm reproducing the labor, but now this labor is de-skilled. We're not talking about a skilled journeyman who's going to become a master craftsman. We're just talking about basic labor, no skill required. Right, I'm going to train you within a number of days to do what you need to do, and little by little, of course, you're going to if you stick around, um, you'll learn a lot. But uh, but that's not the point. The uh, the point is that you're replaceable. You know, I'm not I'm not spending years and years developing you into a great laborer. Uh, I can replace you at any time. You know, if you give me a, a hard time, I can just kick you out and fire you and hire somebody else and within a few days have everything back to normal. And um, so the commodification of labor is very important here. That's what makes my whole shop run smoothly is I'm not so socially invested with these, with these workers. I can just hire and fire them as I need and I don't have to deal with all their personal life and I don't have to develop a personal relationship like in the apprentice relationship. But each labor has to make a certain, has to contribute enough labor in the whole division of labor process to make a certain number of swords so that I can give them enough money to feed them at a subsistence level to keep them in their lifestyle. Uh, but then a certain number of, of swords uh, a certain amount of that labor is is over and above what's needed to reproduce their labor, and that's the part that I'm accumulating now as a capitalist. Okay, and so master craftsman morphs into a capitalist, somebody that has accumulated enough wealth to go into the marketplace, buy the commodity of labor at a low price, work that labor through the variability of labor to do extra work on my behalf and I accumulate more and more wealth. And so I turn my money into money plus a little extra. So make my, more money out of money. And I do that, I take money and make it more money through the capitalist enterprise and the marketplace, but the capitalist enterprise the characteristic of it is this commodification of labor. <clears throat> and having labor that's a lot less skilled than it used to be. Okay. And this is, uh, you know, this is the system in which you live. Uh, when you go look for a job, uh, you're putting yourself on the marketplace, but not you as a person, you as a basic laborer, all right? You are selling your labor as a commodity and you're going to sell your labor for less than what it's worth um, so that the person who, who employs you can get extra labor out of you and, and, and appropriate that labor 
for themselves uh, and accumulate more and more money. And you're going to be kept at your standard of living and, and uh, you know, and, and I will just hire and fire you as, as I need. <clears throat> um, now this this picture um, of production and the commodification of labor um, hopefully at this point after going through the other phases makes a lot of sense to you and and it seems clear right just this final step of commodifying labor and then the division of labor and so that it's de-skilled labor um, that's the key difference between feudalism and capitalism. And of course, in feudalism, we're, we're lumping together ag agrarian production and burger production. That's all taking place within, at least within the failing, you know, the high feudal period. And as it's decaying, uh, burger production becomes more significant, money economy becomes more significant. And then eventually you get these capitalists that just have a lot of money um, and who are not necessarily part of the aristocracy. So that's a really key difference, too, is that the typical capitalist uh, in this historical um, development is not a landlord. And so they're not part of the nobility. They're not part of the whole social hierarchy. They're just someone who was a commoner, who was just part of the riffraff, the 85% that were originally serfs. They get pushed off the land and come into the city and then some of these commoners end up accumulating a, a, a tremendous amount of money wealth. And, and then some of those who accumulate this uh, tremendous amount of money wealth, uh, some of those become bankers, of course, that's a great way of making more money out of money, usury. But uh, another great way to make more money out of money is to uh, set up bourgeois production buy unskilled labor as a commodity from the market, uh, buy the raw materials, the equipment and the facilities uh, using your money, and, uh, and then just manage this labor in such a way that you get more labor out of them than what you need to pay for. And then you keep that surplus labor in the form of of money wealth and you accumulate more and more money. So this is a very good way of accumulating money after money after money. Um, and uh, I don't think there's too much more to say about that. Um, but uh, of course, if you have questions, uh, about this, then I, I'd like to hear those on uh, Pronto. You can post those questions. And, and of course, if we end up with a lot of questions, we can always have a Zoom session or something like that. But, um, <clears throat> but uh, so be thinking about this. Does, this. does this make sense? Are there things that don't, don't quite jive, you're not quite clear on? Uh, let me know. But that whole phases, uh, that whole phase story that I told you, starting with uh, species being and then primitive production and then agrarian production and then burger production and finally bourgeois production, that's all to just explain this bourgeois, bourgeois production because the, the basic core uh, is still there. Things are just kind of obscured by the marketplace. And and uh, notice that the ecology, this green part, the green here, uh, is, is the basic, all the green lines and boxes, those are, <clears throat> those are uh, the part that, that goes all the way back to species being. And then, and then everything else has just been taken over by commodification. Uh, through marketplace exchange. Uh, but the basic species being structure is still there. Uh, and so it's just undergone all these modifications and morphines uh, until we get to the state of things. Uh, and all right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at that. <clears throat>